again. This is Jennifer Carroll with uh, our latest edition of the Florida Appeals Journal. And today, I think we'll talk about a very particular issue, I think, of interest to, to most attorneys and to, to many clients, too. It's good to understand everything you can about attorney's fees. So many issues about attorney's fees. Today, we'll talk about attorney's fees uh, in partial contingency cases and application of a multiplier. So we all with some basic, uh, have a basic understanding of uh, what's called Lodestar. You know, you have a, you have someone to come in and testify on a reasonable uh, hourly rate, take the number of hours, reasonable number of hours, usually an expert for that, multiply them, and then you get your Lodestar and trial court can uh, go with that. They can go up, they can go down. Um, but if it's a special kind of case that meets the uh, checklist, the requirements in the case law, uh, an attorney may be entitled to an enhancement uh, by 1.5 1, 1. to 2.5 times the amount of the Lodestar. And uh, it, so that is, the, it's important to understand when is a multiplier applicable? All right. So it, there's a good case, and it's out of the fourth, uh, just a little bit older. It's Manow, M-U-N-A-O, V Homeowners Association. Uh, and that's 740 Southern 2nd, 73. That's 4th DCA, 1999. That's an interesting case. It really gives a good summary um, uh, about the multiplier in partial contingency cases. And we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a partial contingency case. Um, and now in that case, the court, appellate court held that the trial court properly applied a contingency risk multiplier in determining the amount of the homeowner association's uh, attorney's fees. So the court uh, cited the Lane case, and that's a Supreme Court, uh, 1990 Florida Supreme Court, uh, Lane v. Head, 566 Southern 2nd, 508. And I think it's very important to remember uh, this part of the holding that the use of a multiplier is within the trial court's discretion. Um, it, in, certainly in instances when the attorney's fee agreement is partial and that quote, attorneys should be encouraged to take cases on a partial contingency fee agreement since this policy will also encourage attorneys to provide services to persons who otherwise could not afford the customary legal fee. And they're citing the Lane Court at page 511. And uh, they said that in uh, the Munau case, that the Lane Court concluded that, quote, when a fee arrangement is partially contingent, the court has discretion to apply the appropriate multipliers mandated by, and it's the Quanstrom case, which you need to know that if you don't know it already, 555. Southern 2nd, 828, and that's Florida 1990, and that's a Supreme Court case. And Quanstrom enumerates uh, several factors that a trial court can consider in determining a role of reasonable attorney's fee. Now, in Munau, um, in determining whether a case, and we're talking about the partial contingencies also, is a proper case for application of the contingency risk multiplier, the court said you can consider several factors. And uh, these factors include, okay, were the contracts contingent, uh, and it's, this is the contracts between the attorney and client, or they a contingency fee contract. And you're, it could be a partial also. You're looking at, is there an element of risk involved? And by the way, and then before I continue with that, I just want to emphasize, you know, the whole policy behind allowing multipliers is we it allows attorneys to take on a case that most attorneys won't take on because if they're not getting paid up front, they're not being paid directly by the client. But you've got clients, especially in certain types of cases where they really can't afford an attorney. And so they need to either prosecute and often to defend themselves against bigger, larger entities with lots of money. So, you know, there are statutes and areas of the law where you've got to uh, allow this uh allow this into uh, the playing field to really equalize it uh, so that it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so continuing, okay, contracts, were they contingency fee contracts too? 
Were the questions involved in the case complex? You don't want a cookie cutter case, right? Um, if the case is class action, or the case was aggressively litigated on both sides and agreements were seldom reached between the parties. And that's an important factor the court uh, included in its application checklist. Uh, then third, the case, does the case, did the case have at best an even chance of success at the outset? And then the next factor is the results. Were the results obtained by plaintiff's counsel outstanding? Generally want that. And next, uh, was there a realistic possibility of payment of the legal bills rendered from plaintiff's counsel to the plaintiffs? Um, and in these cases, you would expect it's not going to be realistic to expect payment. And you go into the next factor, the hours that plaintiff's counsel was required to expend undoubtedly cut into other activities, meaning they couldn't take paying files. Okay. And you can also look at the relationship that uh, the client has uh, with the counsel as well. So those are factors that are laid out uh, in that Munau case. And I recommend uh, that you read that. And I think what's interesting, I think that the fifth district came out with an interesting case and that's BMW. Well, I think it was a BM. It was BMW of North America versus Henry, and that's 336 Southern 3rd, 1255. That's BIT DCA, and that was April 2022. What was actually really interesting about that case is that was a kind of standard hourly fee contract. And of course, the other side was saying, hey, that's a standard contract, hourly fee. That's not contingency. But the court, and this is what's fascinating about the case, the court described what it means to be contingency. And so I'll quote, the trial court appears to have misunderstood the meaning of a contingency fee in reaching its conclusion. A contingency fee is not simply undertaken representation with the understanding that legal fees will consist of a percentage of the recovery. Uh, in consumer cases such as this, representation on that basis would be uneconomical for lawyers where the likelihood of obtaining a substantial money judgment is relatively low. It's an important factor, not your typical PI case, right? Quote, representation on a contingency basis also includes representation on an hourly fee basis where it is understood that the lawyer will seek fees only from the adverse party. The client will not be responsible for paying fees in the event of an unsuccessful lawsuit. And then they cite the Dowd case quote, a fee is certain if it is payable without regard to the outcome of the suit. It is contingent if the obligation to pay depends on a particular result being obtained. And actually, they, they cite a, actually a U.S. Supreme Court case, DAGUE 112 Supreme Court 2638. So that's important uh, in understanding uh, what it means to be a contingency case. And in that umbrella, within that umbrella are partial contingency cases, which can be hourly fee contracts. But again, you know, it's a, you can have a standard contract uh, with your client on hourly uh, hourly rate, uh, then the uh, and then they have an obligation. But what's the? How are they going to meet that obligation? So you can have an understanding, as I have in many cases, where, well, you'll pay the obligation to our efforts to go against uh, the opposing side for fees uh, when you have a basis, of course. It would be a statutory basis usually. All right. So that's important. That's really some, some, I think, really great information. And I just want to cite to you the Joyce case. You need to be aware of Joyce. That's uh, a Florida Supreme Court case, 2017. Probably the most recent um, Florida Supreme Court case addressing uh, the multiplier issue. Or, uh, the contingency yeah, fee multiplier issue. That's Joyce v. Federated National Insurance Company, 228 Southern 3rd, 1122, Florida, 2017. And it's a good case, lengthy case, but gives a great discussion about the history of multipliers. It cites to the Quantstrom decision and the factors to be considered. So you want to be aware of that. Now, in Joyce, the Florida Supreme Court rejected the Supreme Court decisions that eliminated the multiplier under federal statutes. And the floor, the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, made clear that the case does not have to be, quote, rare or, quote, exceptional, 
before a trial court can apply a contingency fee multiplier. So that's very, very significant. And that's actually at pages 1125 to 1126. And uh, so I, I would recommend you you take a look at that uh, case because um, uh, those are, I think, some of the key, really the key cases that sum that up in a nutshell for you. Uh, so that's what we're talking about today is the attorney's fee multiplier and the partial contingency uh, case. Any questions, by all means, uh, give us a, a, a shout and uh, you can email us and uh, we'll do our best to try to answer that. Uh, so thank you again for attending today. I hope you found this a little bit helpful and uh, we'll be getting in more detail uh, in some of the next few uh, discussions with respect to attorney's fees and the many, many issues uh, involved uh, with those attorney's fee disputes involving uh, attorneys uh, and clients. And, and hopefully we can get a better understanding of what's going on current in the courts. Thank you again. Hi, I'm Jennifer Carroll, and I want to thank you for watching our video. You can see more of our videos right here. Uh, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below so you won't miss a single one.